Hi, we're here today with Brad Hayhow, a consult um, neuropsychiatrist in public and private practice in Perth, Western Australia, and associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Notre Dame, uh, Free Fremantle. All right, hope I didn't mess that up too badly. Uh, thank you for being Perfect. here with us. Um, we're really excited. This is the first time that we've had a chance to interview you. We've heard wonderful things about the work that you're doing in the Perth area. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you are doing and who you're working with? Yeah, sure. Well, thank, thank you very much for inviting me as well to speak uh, from the most remote city in the world, apparently. Um, yeah, so as you said, I, I work in public and private practice in Perth, um, which is where I did most of my psychiatry training um, and did a lot of work with the neurologists when uh, I was a trainee. And so that sort of built up for me into to continuing to work um, in this area, I guess. Um, and so uh, I, I mostly see in the FND space patients um, either in clinic or occasionally in hospital during acute presentations. Um, and I'm also fortunate to work with a really great multidisciplinary team in the public hospital where I work, uh, including a, a neurologist who trained with um, John Stone over in Edinburgh. Um, and so yeah, we, have a, we have a very uh, good collaboration. That's wonderful. It's great to see that um, all the many doctors that are working well with one another across borders and, you know, and taking that um, knowledge that they learn and then taking it on to other places. So it's so great to see that. Um, you mentioned that you work in kind of a multidisciplinary treat, treatment group. Um, what does that entail? Uh, like OT or physiotherapists? Mm. What type of other clinicians are involved? In well, we're, we're really still in the process of developing um, a model that we sort of apply consistently. Um, but uh, we've, got the, we've got the sort of first most important part of the model, which is um, uh, the attitude of the clinicians, really. And so True. we, so up on the ward, we've got, um, you know, a multidisciplinary team with, as you, you know, OT, physio, speeches, dietitians, um, and they're used to, they're, they're trained in you know, stroke and epilepsy and those kinds of conditions. Um, but uh, have come along for the journey really with FND. And um, as you and I were talking about another time, it's, it's something that has really uh, only been on the radar in Australia anyway for, for a fairly short period of time. So, so people are coming up to speed quite quickly. That's so wonderful. And you also touched on such an important part is that first, the first step in the whole process is having a team that has a positive attitude towards FND. That is, that is the foundation of what every program is really built on. And so that's wonderful that you found that team and have been able to put um, everyone together like that. Uh, as you mentioned, we kind of talked a little bit before. One of the things that came up is um, that unfortunately that um, there are some areas that still have medical professionals that aren't on that same line of thinking. Why do you think it is that some clinicians are dismissive of um, FND patients and where do you think that mm. kind of stems from? <clears throat> well, I, I think that perhaps there are a couple of factors there. Um, I think there's been a lot of confusion over the years about the range of, um, well, psychiatrists would call them disorders, but the range of disorders that exist in, in uh, that area of somatization, unexplained symptoms, um, malingering gets mixed up with, uh, with conversion disorder is one of the older terms with hysteria from the more distant past with charcoal, all of those things. Um, and really it's, it's not, it's not, it's none of those things. And, um, that's something that John Stone, I think has really, uh, helped people understand. Um, and so I think people who've become familiar with his work um, are able to understand better where FND fits in a spectrum of illness presentations that they that are not generally well understood. 
So I think that's one, one part of it. I think the other part of it though is that uh, as, as doctors, I think we all like to um, feel that we can help our patients. And I think some conditions um, uh, sort of push buttons for doctors about whether or not they are competent helpers. Um, and I, I think FND is one of those things because there's not a lesion to point to, there's nothing you can cut out, there's not a drug you can give. Um, it, it sort of challenges how doctors practice medicine, I think, um, most of the time. I think you do put up a very, um, bring up a very good point. And I think that there are limitations and that's something that even as a patient, we have to be prepared to allow for that area of uncertainty and that we all need to just work together as we're both trying to navigate this kind of um, area of medicine that we, we really just don't understand yet. So I think you hit on two very good points and I think identifying those are some of the first steps of getting past that and hopefully with research we will um, move past that. Um, as far as the, like, um, the patient Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say that the patient, um, the patient ownership of FND is also really important, and it's really distinguishing it from other conditions, um, because so many of my patients will come and say that they, after they've received a diagnosis or they, they've they finally, you know, come to understand themselves what's going on, they'll go and speak to their GP and they'll say, well, my GP had never heard of it, but. Um, the patient in some ways then becomes their own advocate. And uh, so many people I've met with FND um, have become ad advocates and educators of uh, doctors as well. And there are, to their credit, there are fantastic GPs around Perth who um, like to go on that journey with their patients. That's fantastic. Um, as you talk about kind of the journey and moving forward, what are your hopes in your area as far as being able to prepare um, provide a level of care that's maybe not available now? Is, is there any hopes to move in a bigger direction? Mm. Or are you doing what you can? What would you like to see? As I'm putting you on the well, spot. I, yeah, well, I think, we, I think we're doing um, a lot better at the diagnostic side of FND now, and that the next challenge is, is more the management side. So. It is, it's possible now in many places for people to see uh, a physician or a specialist who does know what FND is and can um, uh, make the diagnosis with confidence and that's an important first step. Um, but access to treatments is, I think, something that is still required both um, in terms of health departments funding um, rehabilitative treatments, but also uh, in the research uh, realm in, in terms of identifying which treatments work and um, are the best, give the best sort of benefit for the investment and all of those things that we ordinarily do with medicine. Right. Uh, well, you mentioned diagnosis and uh, that's, it's great to see that th that is starting to be um, a more natural process. Do you find that patients, when they do have a bad experience with that diagnosis? Is that usually coming from maybe going to an ER and it happening the incorrect way? Or, you know, how, how does that usually manifest, I guess, when it's wrong? And what would be your suggestions on how to? Yeah, well, I think um, ED presentation or ER presentation is problematic because uh, often when FND begins, you know, it, it begins in a way that no, nobody understands what's going on. And we have presentations uh, with differential diagnoses that include stroke and seizure um, and all sorts of other um, neurological problems. And, and they need to be properly assessed. And so often, often the journey begins in an acute setting, um, but it's a setting that is not well um, structured to really move forwards with the diagnosis, I think. So um, I think often patients um, have the 
experience and report the experience of being discharged with nothing more than uh, knowing what it isn't. So, you know, you're not having a stroke, a heart attack, or a, you haven't developed epilepsy, um, but perhaps being left not really knowing what has happened in that case. And so one of the things that I um, would like to see uh, that I think could be ease, relatively easily and constructively implemented would be making onward referral pathways really clear from emergency departments. And we, we always try in the neurology department I work in to raise a differential diagnosis of FND early um, with the people we see. Um, some of those people, some of those patients will go on to have a neurological diagnosis that is structural. Um, others will come, will go on to have functional diagnoses. Um, but I think raising the whole spectrum of possibilities is an important first step because then the doctor and the patient together goes on that journey of honing in on the correct diagnosis. So I think that's something EDs can do. That, that's a great point. And, and I think it would help patients not feeling like they've been blindsided by something one way or another. If it's just added in that we accept FND as a diagnosis that could be just on the spectrum of anything else, then it's going to kind of even out um, and probably take away some of that stigma and stuff that is sometimes unfortunately mm. associated with that as well. Um, also kind of talking about some of the diagnostic um, terms and things that are used. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, disassociation and how psychology maybe plays a role in the diagnosis. Um, there's many patients mm. that are found that don't have a psychological connection that, um, to their symptoms, but there are many that do. Um, can you kind mm. of touch on maybe where that might fit in for some patients? Yeah, I, I think I think this discussion also kind of lives naturally in a destigmatization space because um, a, a group of experiences that are common in FND are dissociative experiences where people experience a loss of control over their body or a, an, an inability to initiate voluntary movement or suppress a tremor or um, have a conversation. And um, I think I, I think about the brain in a in a very evolutionary way. I think about it being built up from you know fairly old and primitive functions to more recent and more complicated and complex ones. And um, a, a psychological defense that many animals have uh, is dissociation, which is you might think of as the freeze part of a fight, flight or freeze response to a threat. Um, and it's a way that normal people sometimes insulate themselves from traumatic experiences. Um, and the example I often give is first responders at accidents uh, will often need to put aside their horror at the at the scene before them in order to um, perform their professional role. And, and, and that in a way is a, is a normal function of dissociation. And normally dissociation ends, um, but I think there are some, in some cases it, it perseveres. And I think there's a relationship there between uh, normal dissociation uh, progressing into a more um, chronic or prolonged form, which which does interact with FND in some cases, um, and, but and I think it's useful to know that that it's um, that dissociation is a normal psychological function, um, and it's also it also I think it belongs in uh, it, it belongs in the same language category as a functional rather than a structural disorder. It's it's something that. Uh, is about how our brains work. Interesting. Um, is there anything that we've touched on today or haven't touched on that you'd like to um, talk a little bit more about?
Um, one thing that I, I guess I'd like to say is that I, I've really benefited myself from the international collaboration um, that has occurred in FND. It's really quite unique from my point of view. And the, the opportunity to learn so much from the other um, physicians who are working in this area uh, in Australia and in the UK and in the US has been really great uh, to benefit from the, the data that they've produced. Um, and also from the patient network, as I was saying, it's really been a, such a productive collaboration. It, it really has been um, amazing to watch how it, it really seems like everyone does work together and um, very respectful with one another's work and trying to see how everyone can add to it and kind of progress things. And I think that that's why uh, FND has come so far in these last few years is because of that collaboration. So thank you for bringing that up because I do think that that's a really important part um, that everyone works together. So we um, really appreciate uh, you taking time out of your busy day to visit with us and um, we look forward to speaking with you more in the future. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much.